finally has come back to to lighten our wallets and fittingly they've chosen to kick things off with an iconic dinosaur Parasaurolophus now I have an extra soft spot for this animal because when I was a little kid the book that got me hooked on dinosaurs which I'd borrow at least 10 times a year from the library was this one and guess who's the cover girl? Surprisingly, I only have one other model, my old Carnegie, which is very retro, as you can see here. I did have the Deluxe Collecte, but I have no idea where it is. Now, there are three specimens of Parasaurolophus. Cierto Cristatus is the smallest, with the most curved crest, and possibly a female dimorph of the other two, which are Tubison, the largest species, and Walkeri, which is this PNSO version. Parasaurolophus walkeri is estimated to have been 9.5 meters, which is about 31 feet. So at 27.5 centimeters, about 10.9 inches, this PNSO is 1 to 34.5 scale, effectively 1 to 35, which should please a lot of people. And you can see here the typical hadrosaur bow plant which is elegantly beautiful in and of itself, but of course Parasaurolophus had this distinctive crest. There have been many suggestions what it was for, and some like the use as a snorkel were easily rejected due to the inconvenient absence of a hole at the end. Others have more support. For example, sexual display at mating age. Now based on juvenile finds, we think that Parasaurolophus didn't really start growing them until the skull reached about 50% adult size, as you can see in this hypothetical growth series. Now another idea is as a resonating chamber for vocalizations, especially at the lower frequencies. Here, the crest is brilliantly colored in an orange to yellow fade, with the dark brown blend echoing the rest of the body. And overall, this color scheme highlights its display function, but it's more subtle than either the PNSO Corythosaurus or the PNSO Lambiosaurus. Now here, viewed from the top, you can see how it expands into the nasal region. And from beneath, I really like how you can see that the rostral almost envelops the predentary, fitting perfectly together. The blue eyes are eye-catching, very true to the release images, with the black pupil centered very precisely. There's a calming, almost soulful look to the blue eyes. The face you can see is very detailed with scalation, but very gently so, and the colour is very close to the product images. And in fact, that's the case for the rest of the body, which I'm really happy with because when the images came out, I really liked the subtle, soothing blend of browns, um, countershaded with this very pale, um, with this very pale, lightest blonde colour, very easy on the eyes. The blended transitions are absolutely smooth and flawless. The stripes are subtly and naturally applied. And the crenellations from the spinal osteoderms also blend equally seamlessly into the rest of the body. And together with the blue eyes, the whole effect just speaks peace and calm to me. By now, you've obviously seen how detailed and exquisite the scalation is. Now, it's a common complaint that scalation is often over-exaggerated in form and size that you shouldn't be able to see at smaller scales. Yet, you won't find that here. Now, this dinosaur has the gentlest of skin creases and wrinkles at logical tension points.
there are very small osteoderms in the back, the flanks, the side of the tail, which don't call out for attention, and that's very realistic. There's a tendency to color osteoderms and other feature scales in a way that's, I feel, almost vulgar. And I like this shift very much. The legs are very muscular, more so than the other PNSO hadrosaurs. On the underneath, I like how this fat pad is flattened out, as it would in real life to help cushion the animal during locomotion. Look at the variations in size and shape of these tiny scales, even in an area that few people would even look. And you can see how the scales get even smaller, if that's even possible, down the arm. And then when you transition to the belly, I'm at a loss for words, but subtlety seems to have been the guiding word in sculpting this beautiful dinosaur. Down the tail. And yes, for those of you who care about such things, there is a cloacal slit. Now I want to talk about a really cool detail here. This Parasaurolophus is clearly modelled on the type specimen ROM768 because of this very distinctive V-shaped cleft here, replicated so exactingly in shape and angulation. It's been suggested that this was an attachment site for a ligament supporting the head. The crest then connected to this gap with soft tissue, creating a frill. And that's a look that was quite common in many restorations. There's also the idea that this notch neatly made way for the crest, giving the head freedom to move without obstruction. Generally though, it's been considered a pathology, even by Parks in 1922. In fact, this Parasaurolophus had multiple pathologies, and my favourite paper on this is the 2020 paper by Bertozzo et al. Apologies, I'm probably butchering that name, and I hope he never watches this video. Now Bertozzo paints a vivid picture of a particularly accident-prone animal, and you can see it's not just this deformation between the 7th and 8th vertebrae that uh, he terms a saddle, but also the fusion of the 6th and 7th vertebrae with the discoid overgrowth. Multiple rib fractures, an abnormal growth of the pubic peduncle, and even dental disease. The paper suggests that some of these injuries could have been caused by a falling tree, animal, or some other heavy object. There's evidence of bone regrowth, so they were not believed to be fatal. Now, we don't know if they happened at the same time, but if I were to speculate, perhaps um, this spinal trauma here caused some spinal cord damage, in turn creating some neuromuscular deficits, leading to poor coordination, decreased muscle power, decreased motor control, and hence, perhaps creating a clumsy animal that was prone to other injuries. Now on one hand, I feel happy to have this pathology included, but on the other, I feel that uh, for people who don't know about this, and they're quite used to getting picture-perfect specimens from PNSO, this might give them the wrong idea of the animal's true silhouette. The paper also gives a detailed reconstruction of the neck. Now we've seen shrink wrapping in dinosaur heads, but it happens elsewhere too. Parasaurolophus has been traditionally restored with a graceful, swan-like neck without considering soft tissue bulk. Bertozzo goes into delicious detail on this, such as considering the nuchal ligament, which holds up the neck and head. Without going into too much detail, this diagram suggests eight possibilities, depending on the different volumes, points of origin and insertion of this ligament, and you can clearly see how each possibility affects the shape and the thickness of the neck. Now surprisingly, in the skeletal drawing that PNSO includes with their figures, the silhouette has this modern interpretation, but the actual skull has that more swan-like neck. And I believe it's because this model was completed before the Bertozzo paper came out. 
and while they could still change the image, it was too late to redo the model. But I think PNSO deserves credit for being honest and giving us the current silhouette instead of just hiding it with an older image. Now, hadrosaurs are facultative bipeds, meaning they usually walked on fours, but for speed, they could run on two legs. This Parasaurolophus is posed in a relaxed amble, which is great because I like my dinosaurs doing normal things, not always in fight or flight. So let's do a quick comparison with the other PNSO Lambiosaurines. Now we have Audrey, the Lambiosaurus. And Caroline, the Corythosaurus. You can appreciate the similarity of this elegant bow plan in all three. But Parasaurolophus is bulkier than the other two, which many people feel are too slender. But all of them have that general dignity and even majesty. For reference, the Corythosaurus I estimate to be 1 to 30 of scale, and Lambiosaurus at 1 to 38. And uh, the Parasaurolophus, to recap, I estimate to be 1 to 35 scale. The happy result is that I now have my three essential Lambiosaurines from PNSO. And just for those of you who have it, here's the Wild Safari 2020 at Montosaurus, which is about 1 to 45th scale. So, there's the PNSO Parasaurolophus, marking PNSO's return to our wallets. Now, I can't wait to see what else they come up with, but I'm hoping they'll have a sauropod soon. And on the bipedal side, I believe they're doing Carcharodontosaurus next, but I also think it's high time they did an Allosaurus. Now, all in all, Parasaurolophus is a special dinosaur for me, and I'm really pleased to have an updated model from PNSO. Except for the thickness of the neck, this is generally scientifically accurate, well sculpted, and aesthetically painted. And I wouldn't be surprised if this version of Parasaurolophus is my favourite for a long time to come. So, I hope you enjoyed this video of the very first PNSO in a while, and I'll see you soon. But meanwhile, stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe, and stay solvent. I'll see you guys soon.